15 minutes with some oh shit you started the you started the webinar oh did i okay yeah, yeah. wait a second can i end this yeah we should we should end it and come back in <laughs> morning everybody good afternoon good evening wherever you are in the world welcome to mnr wednesday um it gives me absolutely great pleasure to 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 introduce uh, today's speaker alexander graver um but, but before i do that let's just remind everybody uh that you're on a sorry just back up that you can view ex uh, previous uh, MNRs, you go to the MTNet MNR page or you go to the YouTube channel and you can register for the upcoming MNRs and we have a fabulous list of speakers coming up till, till the end of June. Um, you're on a, a webinar, so less controls than on a, than on a Zoom meeting. Um, you can send a chat message. Please send your questions in the Q&A and then at the end of the presentation, if you want to speak, then raise your hand and uh, we'll make audio available to you and we can get we can get into a discussion and we we like to promote discussions during these seminars. So today, whoa, yeah, ne next week's speaker, just a quick advertisement is uh, Sue Webb of the uh, University of Vatersrand in Johannesburg, and she's going to talk to us about uh lightning strikes and weathering and um flashes of brilliance linking magnetic evidence for lightning strikes with weathering and regional lightning controls that'll be really quite exciting and it'll be a, an hour earlier than uh, than today so today's speaker alexander graver uh, i've known alexander for a few years now and he's a very very impressive uh, scientist and he's going to talk to us about three-dimensional empty modeling and inversion in a spherical earth applications to continental scale surveys and this really is given the given the continental scales surveys that we're doing these days this really is an important issue so very quickly alexander earned a, a diploma in geophysics from Okutsk in 2009 and then he's been he was at potsdam and then got his uh, his doctor's degree at the University of Berlin in 13, and he moved to uh, Zurich, where he's been a postdoc, and since uh, 17, a lecturer. And he's recently been awarded a, a German Science Foundation Heisenberg uh, Fellow. So at that, I'll ask you, Alexander, to share your screen and, and uh, tell us about continental scale surveys. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alan, can you confirm that you are seeing the, the right screen? Yeah, everything's fine, Alexander. Everything's fine. Okay, good. All right. So, okay, I, I, I'd like to uh, to begin by, uh, by saying thank you to the to the organizers of this series. It's, it's a great pleasure to be part of this series, which I myself uh, enjoyed uh, a lot. And indeed, today uh, we will be talking about uh, modeling and inversion um, in spherical Earth. And it turns out that this is a pretty rich topic, uh, which uh, um, which uh, forces us to to touch uh, all the all the aspects of of doing MT uh, from very fundamental model that we have been uh, using to sort of uh, some of the technical numerical issues uh, that we are also facing nowadays uh, with the uh, with the current uh, data sets and before i go to my first slide i'd like to also acknowledge the uh, the contributions from a variety of people with whom i have been working on this topic for for a few years now and in particular Filippo Tsekete and Federico Munch, who have been students and postdocs and postdoc, uh, and who, uh, whose results I will uh, show uh, in this work. So they have been doing a great work uh, in terms of running some of the uh, inversions and, and modelings. And we have worked on numerous 
and methodological uh, and theoretical aspects with with Alexei as well. So uh, the motivation uh, behind this uh, this work, of course, are projects that that are very unique and uh, and and really uh, push forward the the community, the the topics in many different aspects. So they, they push forward instrumentation, they, they necessitate more efficient data processing and archi arch archiving. And they also need us to think on, on how we do the modeling and, and inversion on the tools that we have and on the workflows that we are used to. And the question I would like to bring up is, is whether our conventional tools uh, allow us to, to take the full advantage of these unique data sets. And I must say that while I will be focusing more on the modeling part, there have already been, and I think there will be talks in this series which, uh, which discuss the, the, this, uh, these types of surveys. So in particular talks by Paul Bidrosian, the Stefan Thiel, and Hao Dong, who have talked on US Array, Auslamp, and, and Sinoprop. Uh, projects. So I, I definitely encourage you to look at this uh, as well. Uh, but then uh, coming back to the to the modeling perspective and and how do we how do we take full advantage of, of such data sets? Uh, there are two aspects that I would like to to cover in this uh, in this presentation, and that is the first one. The, the most fundamental one is the use of the flat Earth model. So as you know, in MT, with the assumption of the perfect plane wave and finite plane wave, we adopt the, uh, the, the flat Earth. So the Earth is flat. And I would like to, to sort of contemplate a little bit on, on the drawbacks and limitations of this uh, assumption once you go to such large scales, uh, to, to the scales of thousands of kilometers and uh, and the, the second top, the, the second aspect is is that as you go to to such large scale, the, the multi scale nature of the problem really becomes very severe. So it it does exist. This aspect does exist at, at many um, sort of uh, at at any scale. So even if you are on a regional local scale, the MT problem is always very multi scale uh, because we have our responses in such a wide period band. Uh, but once you reach, you know, these extreme continental thousands of kilometer scales, the problem is really uh, is is really uh, notoriously difficult. And how do we uh, incorporate all these scales? How do we model them? Uh, is is another big sort of uh, question. Um, okay, so unfortunately, I believe what you can see here is somehow in. Um, Oh yeah, here it comes. So and, and, and the answers uh, which I would like to to pose in these presentations is whether we we can resort to a spherical Earth model and and what the advantages of, of a spherical frame would be in that case and how do we uh, resolve these uh, all these scales that we are sensitive to within a single physically consistent uh, model. And let's just uh, kind of do some some of the basic definitions uh, of uh, um, of the things uh, that we will be touching in this presentation. So, of course, here you recognize our governing equations. So, the the, the, the main ones, at least. So, the Faraday's law and Ampere's law that that couples electric fields and magnetic fields E and H, and we also have some frequency omega. Uh, conductivity sigma. And really when I will be talking about a flat plane model or spherical model, I will mean these two reference frames. So in, in, the, in, the, in the flat model, of course, you, you all sort of recognize this frame. That's probably uh, what most of us have been using um, when dealing with uh, MT or other methods. And, and you adopt this kind of uh, coordinate frame uh, with x, y being sort of horizontal directions and z pointing downwards. And then uh, on the surface of, of this model, you can derive the impedance being the ratio of 
uh, horizontal electric and magnetic components. And when I will be talking about spherical model, I will be talking essentially about a spherical shell or spherical ball geometry um, and, and the conductivity uh, in the 1D case would change now with, with, the, with the radial direction. So it will change as a function uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a distance from the, uh, from the origin of a planet. And you can do actually similar thing on, on a 1D, uh, in, in, a spherical, uh, in a spherical 1D uh, model, you could derive the impedance as a ratio of, uh, of electric and magnetic field components in, in the spherical frame, uh, except that this would be slightly different because uh, your equations in this geometry would have many uh, special solutions and, and you will need to factor uh, some, um, some sort of geometric um, term that I denoted here with N. I mean, if you are a little bit familiar with, with, with kind of uh, partial differential equations in spherical uh, frame, then this N would represent the, the spherical harmonic degree um, and some behavior of the, uh, uh, of the Bessel functions. But anyway, these are technical details that that's 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 kind of interesting, but not the main uh, not the main thing. And in particular, I want to to say that the the magnetotelluric response uh, of a one D Earth has been studied very thoroughly and uh, extensively. And actually, as early as in 1966, there was a systematic study by Shriva Stavar on um, on kind of plane and spherical impedances and the comparison uh, for a variety of earth models so the mathematical uh, details have been uh, have been laid down and and then and then Srivastava studied and compared this these two cases and somewhat less than a decade uh, later from this work Weidel has actually shown that there is a functional relation between plane and spherical models uh, 1d models and this, this relation have been uh, then uh, named after him. So it's called Weidel transform. And some five years later, Dmitriev and Berdichevsky, they came with a, with a very rigorous proof of the validity of impedance for non-homogeneous source fields. So this is something that, that we will uh, actually use uh, in this work to derive the uh, the valid MT transfer functions uh, on, on a sphere. And there have been many more great works. So you can check the references uh, in, in, in the mentioned papers. So these are very, very insightful and very, uh, very nice uh, works. But coming to, to 3D, the situation is not, uh, is a little bit more uh, technical and complicated because uh, because we we do not have a, a single uh, response, we have a tensor now, the impedance tensor, and generally the way we model these 3D impedance tensors in the presence of uh, three-dimensional inhomogeneities is that we impose uh, two polarizations of the uh, of the electromagnetic field, and these polarizations are orthogonal. And, the, uh, and this fact that the orthogonal allows us to form this, uh, this system of equations here where the superscripts one denote fields from the polarization one and superscripts two, they, they are the fields uh, that, uh, that we simulated uh, with, with, the, with the polarization two. And then we can solve this system of equations for the, uh, for the transfer functions at a given period. And thus we can obtain the, the impedance tensor the, and, and the vertical magnetic transfer function. So the, the so-called tipper. And the, the question really now is, if we go to, to a spherical shell geometry uh, and we emplace some of the 3D inhomogeneities within this geometry, what would be an equivalent source representation uh, that would still allow us to uh, derive the valid uh, magnetotelluric transfer functions. And the first, uh, the first, uh, but before I kind of go and elaborate on this equivalent source representation, 
uh, I would like to uh, to sort of talk and discuss a little bit the, the advantages and disadvantages of going to a spherical uh, to a spherical model. I mean, why would we go away from a well uh, defined and uh, elaborated, you know, Cartesian plane uh, flat Earth model, and and sort of embark on this uh, on these uh, complications. And over the years, uh, I have kind of came up with a few arguments in favor of going to uh, to, to spherical frame, and I want to just uh, briefly mention them here. So, the first thing is that. Once you go, once you sort of go to to spherical frame, once you work in, in a sphere, then you you don't need any geographic projection. So, and you are free of any potential distortions or other uh, negative effects which geographic projections may have on your data. And 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 here is just a, a very small, a very simple example. Uh, that uh, that I've uh, I've came up with. So imagine that you have this sort of block uh, uh, on a sphere, and then this block is is forty degrees uh, forty degrees in in size. So it's something roughly four thousand kilometers, and and then as you want to go to to a plane, and and say for instance simulate the empty responses. For this object, you would need to choose what you know a, a projection, and there is no projection that would preserve, for instance, distances, directions, and areas. So you would need to compromise on one of these aspects, and this may potentially have some sort of negative effects if you don't do it uh, accurately enough. And in general, if you go to a continental scales, uh, it's it's not clear which projection you, you should use. Um, so, and which projection is is best? So, uh, and it, it it's also actually easier to archive and exchange data if if you if you work if you if all your models are in 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 the spherical frame. So, uh, over the years, I, I I came to a conclusion that that workflows that minimize number of steps at which you can make uh, any mistake are certainly advantageous because everything is already so much complicated and uh, and has so many uh, details and hyperparameters that sort of reducing the number of uh, of pre and post processing steps is, is certainly uh, an, an advantage and another thing that is kind of technical but nevertheless important is that if you are in in, in a spherical geometry then you can actually uh, minimize or in fact completely avoid any boundary effects so recall that if you are on a plane uh, on a plane flat earth model then of course in one view you can put your boundaries infinitely far and that's sort of the, the physical model that you uh, that you adopt but then if you if you work in 2d or 3d you have to uh, limit your domain you have to cut it at some point and assume that some field at these boundaries you 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 have you have to assume some field at the at the at the sides of your domain and then as well as on the top and at the bottom and and it's not clear for instance how far you need to go with your boundaries i mean what you know one skin depth two skin depth anyway what is the skin depth in a 3d model uh and and all these all these questions they I don't think they have any clear answer, so it's it's a case by case study uh, situation, and uh, and if you are in a spherical uh, shell geometry, then in principle you have no side boundaries, so you 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 just have a kind of a um, yeah you 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 have a sphere right, and then at the bottom uh, you are basically uh, confined by the by the presence of the very conductive core. That represents essentially the perfect electrical conductor boundary, and then uh, the exterior is just kind of the the radiation boundary where your fields radiate to the to the outer uh, insulating space. So in fact, you you have no problems uh, with boundary conditions if you work uh, in full uh, spherical uh, model. 
And another thing which is important um, for those who kind of want to, uh, to look deeper and larger um, is the fact that uh, there are sources, uh, natural uh, variation sources that exist beyond the, the plane wave band. So if this is the, the real spectrum of the magnetic field variations at the Honolulu Observatory, and um, over, the, I think this, the, 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 I took the 70 years of, of time series and converted them to the, uh, to the power spectral density. And you can roughly kind of split this into, into three bands. So the, the plane wave band where the plane wave assumption uh, is valid and so is I mean you can argue I mean maybe you can push it to 20 30 thousand seconds uh, if you are careful enough uh, with the choice of periods uh, uh, but 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 generally you know it, it's somewhere it ends somewhere around 10,000 seconds and then we have a daily band with different ionospheric and oceanic sources and then we have the long period magnetic, magnetospheric band and the uh, the truth is that if you are limiting yourself with MT, then you are basically only sensitive to, to a few hundreds of kilometers. Uh, and to many of you, this may seem like a lot, but this is still only 10%, roughly 10% of, of the mantle. So if you want to, uh, to involve you know, these, these sources that, that, are, that exist at longer periods, they are intrinsically uh, spherical, so they need to be modeled in, in a global sense. And, and, and then uh, if you want to integrate these sources with, uh, with, uh, with magnetic telluric data, with magnetic telluric inversion, then you have to be working uh, in, in, a spherical, in a spherical shell geometry. And this is kind of a, a nice illustration of what this possibly could give you. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the, the the blue model here is the, is some uh, hypothetical uh, true model, and then this is the magnetospheric ring current. So the long period response is usually longer than one day, and these are the skew uh, solar quiet variations. So these are the the, the most prominent daily band uh, ionospheric source that that can also be used to uh, to do the induction studies. And this is kind of the MT uh, taken here to be somewhere in between one and 10,000 seconds, I believe. And so if you invert them separately, you, you, you get sensitivity in the corresponding uh, depth ranges. But then if you combine them all, you see how, how nicely they complement each other and they constrain the uh, almost the whole mantle, or at least like a, a, a major part of, of, of the uh, a major fraction of, of the mantle. And the same, by the way, is true if you want to, uh, if you are working on these large sort of scales from continental to the global, it's very important if you want to, uh, again, integrate with size, seismological geodynamic models. I mean, not only on a qualitative level, but more on a quantitative level, then you would also want to work uh, within the uh, coordinate uh, system that these uh, that these uh, disciplines uh, work, and of course, seismology and geodynamics at these scales is done uh, in in spherical uh, in spherical geometry. So okay, so let's let's come back to a question of whether we can uh, uh, sort of devise a, a source parameterization, a source model that would allow us to derive. The magnetotelluric impedance tensor uh, on on a sphere, and and there are, I think, several options. And the the the, the one of them is is by means of these so-called uniform planetary fields. The idea has been uh, has been put forward uh, almost, I think, forty years ago now by uh, Feinberg and and and, and colleagues. And, uh, and this is basically the, the source field parameterization that um, uh, where your source fields parameterized as uniform planetary fields that propagate along the, uh, along the three axes. Okay, so this, these fields are sort of depicted here and, and they are orthogonal 
So this is what you what you want, uh, because then if they are orthogonal, they would allow you to to write down this coordinate system. So each column here is is one polarization corresponding to one of these uh, source fields, and then you can solve for these polarizations and and derive uh, the 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 impedance tensor. The reason that you need three polarizations on a sphere as opposed to two polarizations. Uh, on on a, on a plane wave uh, on a in, a in a plane flat Earth model is because for uh, for some locations uh, you may get uh, sort of zeros. So if if you take any two polarizations, then your your matrices may become degenerate at some points. And if you have three polarizations, so the system is uh, is always at least uh, has at least two. Uh, um, linearly independent columns and so you can always resolve uh, the two by two uh, impedance tensor and so it reproduces the the plane wave impedance uh, well in in relevant period range so this is this is an example here so this is a, a 1d model of, of of the mantle so there is some uh, conductive uh, uh, conductive thin layer mimicking sediments and then sort of the um, the resistive uh, lithosphere, more conductive asthenosphere, so transition zone and lower mantle. And if you derive now the, the, the plane wave impedance and as well as the spherical impedance transfer function in, in the relevant period range, then you see that they essentially uh, overlap each other uh, perfectly. And, uh, and, and therefore, this, this, this gives you uh, a very and um, MT transfer functions on a sphere. Uh, one limitation of this parameterization is that it will not give you tippers because, uh, because generally the, the BR fields, even for 1D models, will not be zero. So it's still it's possible to, to obtain the, the impedance tensor, but it's not possible to obtain tippers with this, uh, with this parameterization. And the reason it's possible to obtain impedances is actually this proof by Berdichevsky and Dmitriev that that the impedances they remain valid uh, if the source fields uh, vary slowly uh, over the scales of a few skin depth whereas for tippers you need the the the, the, the zero vertical fields uh, which is yeah so and then uh, we can actually compare now the, the impedance uh, tensors that were calculated on a sphere for some 3D model with impedance tensors that are calculated after projecting uh, this, this, uh, this uh, model onto a plane. And, and this was a very simple model with 100 ohm meters, uh, 40 by 40 degree uh, region surrounded by three Siemens per meter uh, by a three Siemens per meter layer mimicking the ocean. And then there was a 1D profile uh, below, below this. So it's essentially one, one kind of block uh, within, a 1D, uh, within a 1D model. Although the, the contrast is, is very big. So this is, this is somewhat, uh, somewhat extreme model. And then uh, you can look at, at the apparent resistivity uh, curves in the relevant period range. Uh, at say location R2, so this is location shown with these with these crosses. By the way, here you see uh, these objects in four different uh, cartographic projections, and these these projections, as you see, they lead to different uh, locations of the of the of the points on the sphere. So because they they sort of uh, transform the, uh, the, the the shapes differently. So what you see here with a with a black solid line is the spherical impedance. So the impedance that was calculated on, on a sphere. And what you see with different colored and dashed lines are the impedances uh, calculated with the uh, with the uh, other the Cartesian so plane wave impedances calculated for all these different projections. And so generally, and, and these dots, they, they show the, the corresponding 1D, uh, uh, 1D impedance, so the apparent resistivity from the corresponding 1D impedance. And you see that 
that there are quite significant differences uh, in, in, in between these curves, uh, sort of indicating that, that there are some effects due to projections that, that can occur. And I must say that the magnitude generally of this effect will depend on the adopted projection. It will depend on the conductivity and it will sort of be, uh, it may not be as, as big in, in some cases, in, maybe in some cases it will be. And generally you can also correct fields and the transfer functions to account for this geographic projection effect. Although I've never heard people really doing that. So, um, okay, so, and a second type of the source parameterization that gives you, uh, for instance, tippers, uh, would be the uh, a source model that is based on, on a sheet current. So the infinitesimally thin uh, layer uh, where you place some current. And, and in this case, you can place the current that flows in the, in the north-south direction. And, and you can also rotate this current to get, uh, to get two additional orthogonal polarizations. So this model was proposed by uh, by, by Kruglikov and Kuvshinov. And, and this gives you the radial field that is zero for any 1D model. And therefore you can also derive tippers on a sphere uh, with this source model. And this is an example of, of the current that, that, that is one of these rotated polarizations. So there is really no physical meaning, uh, we, you know, or it, it's not supposed to mimic any realistic current system, pretty much as plane wave is, is not a realistic physical uh, model. It's a, it's a model. And this is also a source model that kind of, it's a mathematical construct. If you, you know, plug it into uh, Maxwell's equations that, that will give you uh, the, uh, something that, that, that you want. And so both of these uh, models, uh, I have implemented both of these models and, and we have now applied them to, to some data sets and I will uh, show this uh, uh, in a few moments. But now what I want to talk before going to sort of real data and examples, I want to talk about the, the multi-scale nature of the problem. And, and in particular, I want to, uh, to talk a little bit about the, the ocean uh, and the marine sediments effects, uh, the effects of these sort of thin layers, very conductive layers that, uh, that affect our responses. So indeed, uh, the, the average conductance of the ocean and marine sediments uh, might actually be equivalent to the, um, or is in many places equivalent or even exceeds the, 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 the vertical conductance of the whole upper mantle. Um, so, so these are just kind of some, some estimates uh, that, that I've derived and, and, and you can see that uh, the, the, the conductance of the whole upper mantle um, might be sort of uh, even smaller than, than the ocean and, and sediments effects uh, together. And so uh, there is, of course, a very pronounced effect uh, due to these very conductive layers so essentially, they they act as a, as a complex nonlinear filters that that really distort our fields. They attenuate our fields. They distort our fields, and they somehow uh, prevent us from from seeing the mantle, the crust in the mantle, uh, very clearly. And I would like to uh, to speculate a little bit and 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 show you some some of the recent work uh, which tried to uh, to come up with a with a more accurate uh, representation of the ocean. Uh, so it has been very common in the uh, in the M community to to assume just a sort of a homogeneous ocean of uh, typically conductivity something like uh, 3.3 siemens per meter or 3.2. Uh, but actually, the conductivity of the ocean is is much more uh, uh, heterogeneous and complex. But fortunately, is Fortunately, we actually know it pretty well, and and we can we can uh, we can estimate it at a relatively high resolution, and potentially use this for for these large scale inversions to minimize the effect of the uh, 
uh, of the distortions that that ocean and and say marine sediments could uh, impose on our data. And the way say I, I've been doing this is by invoking the the equation of state of seawater, uh, which gives you the conductivity of seawater as a function of temperature, salinity, and in situ pressure. So you can formally uh, write down this, this as following. So on the left, you, you have a conductivity of the seawater, and on the right, you have this, uh, this kind of um, function uh, that calls the, the equation of state and, and uh, as a function of temperature, salinity, and, and pressure. And the temperature and salinity of the ocean, so the pressure you, you can get based on the depth, but the temperature and salinity, they have been mapped quite extensively uh, by the oceanographic community, and there are very well uh, organized and maintained uh, products uh, that, uh, that deliver this information. And one of them is the World Ocean Database and World Ocean Atlas that is based on World Ocean Database. And here you can see the distribution of the temperature uh, and salinity uh, at the sea surface. So you see there is, of course, a very pronounced uh, north-south gradient and uh, in both temperature and, and salinity. Uh, and, but there, is, there are also some uh, longitudinal uh, variations. So you can, you can take this data, invoke the equation of state, and derive the, uh, the conductivity of the world ocean. And this is, these are just two slices uh, from this global 3D model uh, of the ocean conductivity, showing the, uh, the sigma at the sea surface and at 200 meters depth. And again, you, 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 you see, first of all, you see this north-south trend that has propagated uh, from, the, from, the, from the temperature and salinity. So the, the maps are, of course, very highly correlated uh, with the uh, with the temperature and, and salinity, and you can now average this uh, with respect to the longitude and look at some sort of the cross section, the average cross section uh, showing the uh, latitude uh, on the x-axis and depth uh, of the ocean on the y-axis. And here is now the the temperature. Here is salinity, and this is on the right side the uh, conductivity. And so you see that, uh, of course, most of these uh, variations, they happen uh, to be in the, in, in the first thousand meters, roughly, uh, where it goes from approximately six siemens in the, in the, in the, in the equatorial latitudes to, to the value of around three siemens per meter, which, uh, which we mostly use as a sort of the average conductivity of the ocean. But if you are working, you know, if you're if your domain, if the sort of your inversion domain around continents uh, at large scale will include both, you know, uh, high latitudes, low latitudes, and different depth of the ocean, then you know, an assumption of uh, sort of constant three seas per meter ocean uh, may, may, may not be that accurate anymore. And another aspect uh, is that is that there are also marine sediments, and and they get very thick in some regions of the uh, of, of our planet. And imagine that uh, you are working now on these continental scales, inverting sort of for for large scale structures, and you have these very thin uh, layers that that you cannot resolve. Uh, no matter what you, what you, what you do, so you have to kind of include them a priori into your model to avoid the leak, uh, you, you know, to avoid some artifacts in, in your model. And and you can see here a, a recent uh, uh, global sedimentary thickness map uh, called Globset. Uh, it's also open uh, and and available, and you can see that in some regions of the. Uh, of the earth, the, the, the sediments, they are as thick as 10, 10 kilometers. And they can actually become a significant part of what you might think is the ocean effect. But in, in, in reality, there is not only an ocean effect, there is also effect uh, of these very conductive, uh, typically very conductive uh, marine sediments. 
and and uh, and I I've kind of tried to 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 estimate uh, to get sort of a first order estimate on the on the conductivity uh, and uh, of the of the marine sediments or, and also on the vertical conductance um, and and this is sort of uh, what I will show you uh, in the next few slides. So let's look now again around U.S. This is where. Uh, this is where, of course, U.S. array exists, and and this is uh, this is an interesting region uh, because, as you can see, on the east coast we have these extremely thick uh, marine sediments, and we can zoom in a little bit uh, into into this profile along this red line here, going from from the coast into the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean, and we can look first at the uh, at the conductivity of the of the ocean so this is the conductivity of the ocean along this profile um, as was derived based on the salinity and temperature data from the world ocean uh, atlas and using the equation of state of seawater so this is a linear scale going from 2.5 to 5 siemens per meter and as you can see, there is a lot of variability within the thermocline, uh, and then it goes to sort of this value of 3.2 siemens per meter. But this, you know, this first thousand kilometers where the conductivity is very high, they eventually uh, they eventually change the um, change a lot. If if especially if you are working, you know, uh, in this in these coastal areas. And what you see here with the graded, uh, with a with a with a gray uh, shaded area is are the marine sediments as per the uh, GlobeSat model. Uh, so you see that they get uh, very thick, uh, sort of uh, around the, the 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 margin and and this transition from the margin to the abyssal uh, um, plane. And you can also try and get sort of first order estimate on the conductivity of marine sediments. I will show you on the next slide how exactly this is done. Uh, but this is this is what what I get here, and this is now a log scale. Uh, so you, you you generally see that there are sort of again these these trends where the the marine sediments are very conductive uh, right at the uh, at the sea bottom and then they get sort of more resistive uh, towards the depth but if you integrate this conductivity over these thick sediments uh, then the, the 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 total conductance will be will be pretty significant and the way i estimated the uh, the vertical or the, the conductivity of marine sediments is again that uh, by adopting a few models and and open uh, data sets and the first thing you need to you need to know is how the porosity changes uh, within the sediments, and and then as a first order estimate, you can take this simple compaction model, which gives you porosity as a function of depth, uh, and and then there is some compaction uh, coefficient constant here, and this porosity is shown here with with a green line. It generally, of course, depends on on the rock type. And of course, sediments, they're, they're much more complex and heterogeneous, but this is kind of the first order estimate uh, that you can do for, for the whole globe. Uh, and then, and then the, the second thing is that you need some temperature model, how temperature changes within sediments. And again, here you can take the, the temperature value at, at the sea bottom from the world ocean uh, database. Then you can take the, the heat flow uh, at the sea bottom that also kind of has been mapped uh, with different resolution but nevertheless there are pretty good global models for the for the heat flow uh, and then given also some uh, thermal conductivity denoted here with uh, with lambda you can derive the temperature profile shown here with a, with a red line and then these two eventually combined with the uh, with the equation of state of seawater and the arches law they can give you the bulk conductivity uh, within the sedimentary column shown here with the uh, with the solid red uh, with, sorry with a solid blue uh, line. And the final product of all this is that now you have a three dimensional models of the ocean and of marine sediments, and you can 
look at them in terms of the vertical conductance. So the, you integrate the, the conductivity in the vertical direction, and then you get uh, maps of, of the ocean conductance shown here on the, on the left and of, this, of, of the sediment conductance. And in particular, pay attention to, to this area where we used to, where we have very thick sediments. And you can see that the, here, the conductance of the sediments is actually quite a bit higher, a few times higher than the vertical conductance of the ocean. So if you, uh, if you only include the ocean in your model, then you would still have a very high chance of, of getting some um, blobby, uh, sort of artifacts in, in your model that would actually come from, from these uh, very conductive marine sediments. And I even kind of went one step forward and, and modeled this effect at a period of 11,000 seconds. So this is one of the periods in the US array um, data set. And, and, and then uh, here I'm showing you the, the apparent resistivity curves uh, at one of the uh, at one of the locations at the southern tip of the Florida. I mean, these maps are for the for the for the one single period of eleven thousand seconds, and and they show the uh, the off diagonal components of the apparent resistivity on the top row, and then the phase uh, components uh, on the bottom row, and they show actually the difference between the apparent resistivity and phases, where in one case, the model had marine sediments, and in another case, the marine sediments have been sort of ignored. And you see there's quite a, uh, uh, quite a significant effect. Of course, it's mostly on the, on the East Coast where the marine sediments are very thick uh, and, 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 and it's much weaker uh, deep in land or on the, on the Western uh, coast of US where there are no marine sediments or they, they are they are there but they are generally much thinner and here you see the effect with respect to the period at one of the stations at the at the southern tip of the florida as i already mentioned and and again you, there are two curves showing two cases with and without marine sediments and there are quite uh, sort of significant differences so and, and this kind of uh, nicely brings me to the to the to the next uh, topic where or to the next aspect of, of having these multiple scales and and you know okay we have now the ocean uh, which is very thin and, and difficult to to model on on, on on a huge scales and now on top of that we have uh, we have sensitivity of our data to to very different uh, scales and then we have also marine sediments and everything. Uh, kind of makes the story more and more complicated. And the way uh, we have been dealing with this, with this challenge is that we, you know, I've developed a, a, a kind of a, a code that, that, that operates on these types of uh, locally refined meshes, which offer a very natural uh, solution for this multi-scale aspect. So you, you really pause and solve all your equations on these types of meshes. Uh, which have much higher resolution uh, in areas where where it's needed, and they kind of don't waste resources on having very high resolution in areas where where it's all it's not needed. And this has been successfully applied uh, and 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 at, at kind of all scales at, at the local, regional, and now also uh, on on a, on, a, on a larger continental scale within a spherical uh, frame. Okay, so I will just quickly go through some of the applications. And I want again to highlight here that the inversion of the US array data uh, has been a joint work with, with Federico Munch, who is a postdoc now at Berkeley. And uh, I will be showing some of the results that, that we uh, derived together with him. And we took the, this US array. And I want to reiterate here again that uh, that, that I greatly acknowledge the, the fact that this data has been made available. So I think that this, this will create so much uh, nice research output and this will make you know, um, many different groups uh, busy and provide a sort of uh, great uh, playground and great data set for validating and testing the codes and data processing and all other uh, things. 
So anyway, we took this 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 whole US array, which which has approximately 1,100 stations, and we inverted the imp impedance tensor in the period range between 15 and 29,000 seconds, uh, imposing the the five percent uh, error floor, and starting from a homogeneous uh, 100 meters half space uh, plus the the 3D ocean and marine sediments. Uh, were incorporated as these sort of thin layers in in the model. And again, here these these types of uh, locally defined meshes they they become very uh, very useful uh, because you 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 really need a very fine cells at the cost to model this ocean effect, and you generally need much finer cells uh, closer to the to the surface. Uh, as opposed to to a larger depth, and also in areas where you actually have stations, as opposed to areas where there are no stations, and all these can be uh, can be implemented uh, within this within this kind of concept. Showing here you the, the 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 sort of the plane view, and you recognize the the region where we where we have stations, so we have much finer cells. And you also recognize some of the refinements at, at the cost, and and then there are also sort of much finer cells closer to the surface, and then they get coarser uh, towards the depth. And uh, and this is still work in progress. So I will show just really a few things, uh, and and but generally things converge quite well. So we uh, we get sort of nice. Uh, uh, nice converges to an RMS that is uh, smaller than two with this 5% error floor, and we get some uh, somewhat uniform distribution of, of RMS with the exception of few uh, sites. Uh, and then there is just the one sort of single uh, slice from, from the model that I, that I want to show here, and I'm not an expert in US geology at all. There have been War uh, talks and will be talks in this series that I think will will do a much better job explaining uh, the U.S. geology in terms of uh, conductivity models. But nonetheless, I, I want to say here that this model I think overall makes a lot of sense. It pictures all the major uh, features that you expect, and in particular, say it nicely uh, follows. Uh, it nicely shows the the boundary between the uh, of the subducting uh, plate, so here the ISO lines they are showing the uh, the boundary of the uh, of the Cascadia uh, subduction zone uh, from the slab two model, and we generally get this nice contrast in conductivity, and also uh, uh, and also we get sort of some uh, lower. Uh, conductivities in the cratonic areas, and then there are sort of conductive Appalachians region and this east resistor uh, here. And another uh, example, uh, very quickly, I will show you an inversion of some of the tippers uh, over the um, Australia. So this is the work of Filippo Zucchetti, who is a research assistant at ETH here, and he has been uh, combining some of the some of the data sets, deriving tippers and inverting them in, in a spherical frame. And so these are the tippers at uh, 1200 seconds. So you see some of the uh, pretty extreme uh, tippers at the coast and somewhat smaller tippers in the uh, in the inland. Uh, and of course, you don't get as much constraints on the conductivity with tippers alone. But this was just a, a data set that I think uh, is very uh, good for validating these tools. And, and, and still, I think the, uh, the results are very insightful and, and informative. And uh, uh, so again, this is the mesh that, that we have used. And, and eventually, Filippo ran some inversions. And, and he's now analyzing the data and, and the models. And I want to, to kind of bring up one uh, one case here, so the, the Albany station, where the tippers get uh, larger than than one. I mean, they almost reach 1.5 uh, at a period of few thousand seconds, and this has been known actually for many years in the in the in the paper 
the Kamala Un and Barton in 1993, they, they, when they describe uh, the AVAX data sets of some of these stations, they also point out that Albany uh, has the largest induction effect yet recorded at any Australian land station, which was actually noted uh, long before them by Parkinson in, in 1962. So I thought this is just uh, uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> an interesting uh, aspect, and and here is the uh, comparison of these preliminary models. So this is a slice through this spherical model as we obtained by inverting the these tippers, and this is at the depth of thirty six kilometers, uh, which uh, which has a lot of uh, scatter perhaps, but it also has some of the consistent features that, that nicely correlate with the location of some of the known, uh, of some of the known um, tectonic boundaries and geological features that Australians know much, much better than I do. This is a figure from the recent paper by Kay Heinsen and Brand, and they show this, uh, this map and the conductivity here is actually uh, from the model that inverted the very similar data set uh, using sort of more conventional uh, conventional approaches. And this is another uh, slice through this model at the 90 kilometers depth. Now we nicely see the, uh, the cratonic area, which is very resistive. And on the right here, you also, you, we, we also have here the, uh, the P wave velocity, I believe, model. Uh, the aus rem model i believe it's called from kenneth et al and and there are some nice correlations between these uh, velocity models uh, and conductivity models but there are also interesting and intriguing uh, differences between them and this brings me to the uh, concluding uh, slide so i just uh, kind of highlighted here uh, some of the things that we have covered in this uh, in this talk so we have kind of looked and elaborated on the 3 dmt modeling in, in a spherical shell. So I tried to, uh, to justify and motivate sort of this move from the conventional flat earth model, at least when you are sort of going to very, uh, to much larger scales. And, and we have also shortly talked about the ocean, marine sediments, and generally the, the, the effects of this very small, um, features that you cannot resolve within your model, but nevertheless, you have to model them uh, as accurately as possible. And also showed you some uh, work in progress, um, which, uh, which sort of, uh, which is related to ap applying all these new uh, tools and, and, uh, and date uh, to, to continental scale arrays. So, and with that, I, I conclude. So thank you for, uh, for listening to this talk here. Yeah, Alan. thank you very much, Alexander. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, brilliant. That's uh, gave uh, gave not only the people who are actively listening, but you know, there'll be a lot of views of this uh, talk over the next months. Um, perhaps yeah. I'll start off with a quick question, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, Many years ago, when I was when I was a, a student, Ulrich Schmucke came to visit me up in Edinburgh, and at that time, I was I was wondering whether, in fact, the MT impedance tensor shouldn't be a two by two, but in fact should be a three by three. And we had a I had a long discussion with Ulrich, and he said, "Yeah, if you have something like an SQ current, so you got vertical fields, mm -hmm. then you do have to go to a three by three, but." In, in the sort of scale of studies, the regional studies, two by two is sufficient. And now with, with your, um, your, the three uh, different source fields that you have to apply in the global problem, should you not be using a, a three by three MT impedance tensor? Yeah, yeah, I, I actually, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, but, but I think it, it can, I think it, it mixes two things i'm so but still it's very relevant and i think what what i want to 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 begin answering it by by saying that uh the last published uh paper which i think was published after ulrich passed away 
but the last paper of him, and I think it was actually translated from the from the German uh, draft, and it's now available. Um, I don't know where. I think, mm. in, it's, yeah, it was it was brought up during one of these uh, Schmucke Weidelt colloquiums that are held in Germany, and I think uh, you can find it on uh, on GFZ sort of uh, library repository. If you Google for Schm if you search for Schmucker's name, but where where he actually addresses this topic quite extensively, so he he kind of tries to to write down you know the the ex ex expansion of the electric and magnetic fields to a much higher degrees and orders than right. than only the first kind of plane wave term, right. and then he tries to derive a, a series of transfer functions that come from this uh, from this whole. Uh, expansion. Uh, so, so there is much more in the in the data. You know, there is much more than the plane wave component right. yeah, in exactly. the data. The question is, is that just plane wave is such a simple and convenient construct yeah, yeah. that allows you to do many things very easily? Uh, that that going beyond that is not is is very difficult, and. And and I think the goal of these kind of three fields polarizations is simply to mimic the, the plane wave impedance as much as you can. You know, again, it's a it's a it's a construct. You know, it's a it's a construct that gives you plane wave impedance in the relevant uh, frequency period range. Uh, but there is much more typically in the data. That the thing is how to how to take. How to make use of this is 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 is, is a very right. difficult is, is right. a very difficult problem because you if you go away from this sort of uh, sorry if you go away from this plane wave geometry then then you need to assume something for for the source geometry right yeah and I think particularly yeah. you know there's a lot of interest being expressed in GICs and that. That, that leads us to perhaps use these data for looking at the non-uniform parts, these continental scale. Um, well, for instance, if you, if you, we, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of working on this uh, with colleagues. I mean, if you go to slightly longer periods, you know, the, there, are, there are periods up to right. solar cycle right. that bring you all the way theoretically to the core mantle boundary. Right. But these sources are, non-uniform, inhomogeneous, they are special, temporally varying, complex, uh, and whatnot. And, and, and this, is, this is a difficult, uh, difficult problem to, to tackle. But, but there is a lot of information in, in, in there yeah, that we are not using. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think we're just, you know, taking 80% is a huge amount of information in the data. Anyway, let's, <clears throat> let's move on. We have a a question from uh, Ding Juan Lin, and I'll, I'll read it out so it gets in the, in the recording. Good day, thanks for the presentation. It's really inspired me. I have one question on page 26, so I guess slide 26. I'm wondering how to estimate the resistive in phase under the different condition, which is the one with marine sediment and the one without the sediment. Yeah, yeah, it's a busy slide. Probably I've gone too fast through it. But so, so these colorful maps they show difference in ohmmeters and in degrees for apparent resistivity and phase for off-diagonal components between the model with sediments and without sediments. So this is just a one minus two, and. What you see on the second on the right are two curves. You know, the, the blue one is with sediments and the orange one is without sediments. I don't know, was that the question or did I not uh, interpret this correct? I think, I, I think so. I think there was some confusion about the. About Actually, the, I mean, the this is yeah. in this G cubed paper that was published end of the last year. Okay. So, it's 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 kind of described, I think, much better there. I mean, in much more details, anyway. So, okay. Do we have uh, other questions from audience members? 
Um, yeah, one quick question from me, perhaps, while other people are thinking. <laughs> the, I really like this, uh, the gridding and the dynamic gridding. But <clears throat> even so, the, on the continental scale, your cells are two kilometers at the coastline. And at your uh, uh, shortest period or highest frequency of 15 seconds, the skin depth in the seawater is only 800 meters. So, so even, even with these small cells, they're not small enough. Yeah, even that is not enough. Yeah, yeah. You, you could refine further. That's, 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 that's still at some point becomes an issue, especially for inversion. I mean, you could do modeling with, with pretty much any resolution you want, but within the inversion, there are still trade-offs you have to face. And, 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 and in fact, yeah, I, I think it would be worth refining even further uh, around the cost. So it does look, I mean, like you, you, you do, you, we see that you kind of fit some of the coastal stations, but others are not fit as well. Um, so although they're both right at the cost. So those, I perhaps still a more accurate representation and modeling of the ocean uh, would be needed if you want to have these stations that are right at the cost. Yeah. You know? And some of them are really like they look like they are really, <laughs> really, really close. So yeah. So those yeah, who well, measure well, data, I mean, go go a little bit away from the coast. <laughs> well, I guess in the 19th century when they were installing geomagnetic observatories, it was just a lot easier to get to the coast. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, you you you, yeah, you get this you get this very strong. 3D effects, couplings right. of the currents. So potentially there is a lot more sensitivity lot. to everything. Uh, the question is again how to how to extract this, uh, how to extract this, how to model these things accurately that you sort of go to the useful content of this right. data rather than just trying to 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 kind of uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, would it be possible to think about having permanent deployments of stations so you can actually monitor <clears throat> time variations of salinity? Oh, they are monitored. They are monitored. Oh, okay. I mean, this this yeah. what I showed here is the is the annual mean salinity okay. and temperature, okay. and the annual mean is derived from decadal time series. Yeah. I mean, you would be surprised. There are so called Argo floats. There are probably ten thousands of Argo floats at any moment that are floating through the through the ocean all over the world and measuring temperature and salinity. So yeah. they are they are quite well mapped, uh, quite well mapped. The interesting part is that salinity is measured through conductivity. Yeah. <laughs> but they throw away this conductivity. They don't tell you conductivity. They get salinity and then that's it. Uh, but I, I want conduct if there was conductivity, I would need actually to salinity. <laughs> anyway, well, I, I think you've <clears throat> you've given everyone a lot to think about, Alexander. There's oh, we've got a question in from uh, Didas Makoye. Uh, good presentation. As we have seen, the ocean water and sediments tend to act as filters, which may prevent seeing clearly the mantle in local scale. Can the clay cap have a similar effect to image the heat source below the geothermal reservoir? Yeah, probably this is yeah, a valid think, analogy, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's hard to see below strong conductors with the M induction methods. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thanks again very much, Alexander. Thank Wonderful you. talk. And this, uh, this talk, the recording will be available when when Zoom's finished processing it. And if you could send me your, your talk as a PowerPoint, Alexander, I'll put that up at the same time. Okay, so, yeah. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Yep. Yeah. Bye-bye. See, See you next week. <laughs>